Hello, uh, we're here with Hamdi Muhammad, who's running for Port of Seattle, position three. Would you like to go ahead with your two minute introduction? Yes, thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Hamdi Muhammad. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm running for the Port Commission uh, position three. Um, our campaign has been endorsed by Fuse Washington, over 30 elected officials, including US Congressman Adam Smith, Attorney General Bob Ferguson, our County Executive Dow Constantine, US Congresswoman Jayapal, and so many of our community leaders. We have also raised over $50,000 and 100% of the donations that we've received so far have come from individuals. And so we are truly running a grassroots campaign. Um, I believe folks are ready for a regional leader, leader that will make the Port of Seattle's numerous operations accessible and transparent. A leader that will be a strong voice for working families and businesses impacted the most by COVID-19. I'm proud to serve on the Maritime High School's advisory board and will be a strong advocate for expanding educational opportunities for our youth to ensure that they are prepared to enter the workforce after this pandemic. I have dedicated my life to public service at the local level and at the federal level. And just a little bit about me, I came to the US when I was three years old and one of my first ports of entries into the United States was at SeaTac Airport. Growing up, I watched my mom juggle her job at SeaTac Airport and I was 15 years old when I started working at our local businesses to help my family make ends meet. 30 seconds. Uh, Today, I have over 15 years of experience working in King County. I advise on the county's $12 billion budget. I've led initiatives that have invested millions of dollars into our small, uh, our small businesses. And so I'll be a true champion for, uh, for working families. And I'm looking forward to answering any questions today and hopefully earning you guys' endorsement. Thank you. Thank you. So now we'll move into uh, the first of the prepared questions. And Mary Kylie will be asking that. And responses are two minutes in length. Go ahead, Mary Kyle. Okay, thank you. So um, COVID has increased existing inequalities. As port commissioner, how would you support the most vulnerable? How would you promote an equitable recovery and create opportunities for all through the port? Yeah, that is a great, great question. Now more than ever, we really do need strong leadership at all levels of government. And this is really a moment for us to reimagine and rebuild a new economy that works for all of us. Um, I have been serving on the COVID-19 response team since the pand pandemic has hit um, for King County. And so I have been, um, you know, helping set up COVID testing sites, vaccination sites, and have been working with our small businesses and our, our local um, community-based organizations um, to respond to this, this pandemic. And what we see is that the pandemic has impacted our whole region um, and devastated all of our communities, but it looks different. And it looks different specifically for airport communities. Um, if you look at the data there um, in March, 2021, there have been over a hundred thousand people who received unemployment. And if you look at where the unemployment rates are um, coming from the zip codes that you see, most of the unemployment um, uh, folks filing unemployment is coming from, it's really around the airport community. And as you all may know, uh, the port's operations, the largest asset of the port is SeaTac Airport. So it's its largest operation is at uh, SeaTac Airport. And there's a huge workforce that's there. Um, and so really, if we are truly going to build back better, we have to invest in workforce development, um, support our small businesses, 30 seconds. development, reentry programs, ensuring that folks Folks, um, we're, we're doing priority hiring and really supporting our young folks, right? There's a huge labor shortage that is happening right now. We've got to get young people to get excited and to learn about opportunities in aviation and maritime. And I'm prepared to do that and excited to do it. Thank you. Nicole, you're muted. Uh... I don't remember who she said was next. Um, I'm, I think I'm next. But awesome. I'm not sure. oh, oh, there we go. Thank you. Um, how have you worked to combat climate change and promote climate justice? How would you ensure that the port drastically lowers net carbon emissions by 2030 and achieves carbon neutrality by 2050? Yeah. 
That is a, a great question. Um, I am committed to working with our, you know, our port businesses and local community to reduce things like aircraft related pollution, including carbon admission. I am someone who lives in the heart of the ports operation in the airport community. Um, right now, if you look at research that um, has been conducted by the University of Washington, it has found this specific type of pollution called ultrafine particles. It's a pollution that is directly connected to aircraft and has been connected to multiple types of cancers. And so really we need to understand that climate change is real. We need to act um, aggressively um, and make investments to really um, get us towards, uh, uh, to push aviation to be more sustainable. And so uh, reducing things like noise pollution from planes, supporting sustainable alternative jet fuels, investing in quieter jets, um, and really uh, centering the need to transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy is important. Everything needs to be electrified, right? We need to think about that for our port, um, our seaport, as well as the airport. And, you know, I've, I've been, um, doing the work on the ground. I have my boots on the ground. I'm in community, um, uh, working in our, our, our forests, um, as well as holding listening sessions and community sessions about um, the impacts that folks are having and how do we, um, it, where we need to make investments to ensure that we are, um, are moving towards a more clean and sustainable environment. And so I'm ready to do that. Um, and we'll, uh, you know, I think things like high speed rail is really important for the port. It keeps us competitive and also it can be electric, right? Um, investing in uh, charging stations for our, our vessels and looking at all the emerging technologies. And so this is something I, I'm passionate about. It's personal. Um, and so you guys can trust me to be a champion around climate issues. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened to my mic, but uh, <laughs> we're on question three. Nicole. Yeah, so the port has operations and activities on tribal and indigenous land. How would you use your position to elevate indigenous people and encourage more equity and opportunity for BIPOC communities? Give us some specific examples of your plans in this aspect. How would you handle your approach to women and POC owned businesses? Okay, so there was a couple of questions. Um, the, the first one about um, supporting our indigenous community and recognizing the need to do that. I mean, look, the port um, has built our economy as a region and has impacted its neighbors, right? If you look at the Duwamish Valley right now, we turned it into a canal instead of a river. And really that is sacred, um, um, a river and a, a sacred space for our community, for our indigenous communities, our brothers and sisters. And so it is so important that we are you know, making sure that we are getting toxic waste out of those those spaces and 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 accelerating programs that are already existing, and really being a true partner for our communities, right? And making sure that we have um, community responses and that we are partnering with our indigenous brothers and sisters and letting them guide some of our decisions. If I was on the port commission this year, I would have supported the, um, the leasing of the Duwamish Valley Resource Center, a workforce center that supports that community and all of our communities. And as far as um, if I'm answering the, the second question, I'm on time. Um, I have been a strong advocate in supporting our small businesses. I've led an initiative that invested $1.5 million into small businesses impacted by displacement. I managed over $3 million of COVID-19 community response fund that went to organizations that were supporting um, BIPOC community members, small businesses. And so I will continue to 30 do seconds. That. <laughs> I will continue to do that and work in partnership with our communities and not just have these band-aid solutions, but really think about systemic changes, right? Um, we won't need to say things like minority-owned businesses if we were actually thinking about system changes. I have lived experience. I know um, the sort of impacts that um, uh, governmental policies has on our communities. And so you can trust that I'll be a strong advocate there. Thank you. And so now we're going to move on to question four, Laura. What is the port's responsibility when it comes to protecting and lifting up workers? What do you think are some opportunities for improving the port's relationship with organized labor and those workers who do not currently have access to the protection of a union, such as Uber and Lyft drivers? Okay. Um... Great question. Um, 
you know, when I think about the port, I think about my own community. When I look at gig workers, I see so many people who come from my community, right? So many of my even relatives work in those spaces. When I look at our seaport and the truck drivers who don't have adequate access to things like restrooms, you know, my father was a truck driver and, you know, he got into a really terrible accident and lost 15% of his, uh, his vision because he didn't have adequate access to healthcare. And so these things are so um, personal for me. And, you know, if I was on that port commission, I would have supported the $15 minimum wage proposition one, because I know that that is not even just in, it's like a, it's a little bit of a relief for folks who, um, who are working 40 hours a week and in the end of the, the, the month is trying to figure out, do they pay their rent or do they pay a, a, a health bill, a medical bill? And so advocating for gig workers is a top priority for me, ensuring that you know they have things like adequate access to restrooms, that they have access to, um, you know, that we're using our tax levy dollars, which are flexible dollars that come from our property tax and that we're supporting them. Um, you know, when, when I'm elected, one of the things that I would like to do is start a task force or a community advisory group that, that is made up of gig workers that advises the port commissioners, right? The port commissioners are elected by seconds. and should, should advocate for those people who've elected them. Um, so making investments there is really important and helping folks who, um, you know, uh, you know, I, I think it's simple. Everyone must be paid a living wage and that will always be something I will fight for and um, stand behind. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And so now we're going to move into follow-up questions and uh, these responses are one minute apiece. Are there, oh, Jeff, go ahead. Great. Uh, so you're running against an, an incumbent, uh, which is great, but I'd wonder if you would uh, take a moment to uh, distinguish how you would act on the port from how she has, or how, how would your tenure be different? Yeah, you know, um, look, I'm running on a new vision for the Port of Seattle. I am running on one that really centers making the port's numerous operations more accessible and transparent. Now, if like the average person that you talk to today does not know who their port commissioners are or what the Port of Seattle does or that it's a government entity. I think now, now more than ever, we really do need leadership that's gonna be centered in community um, and that is gonna make the port's operations as accessible as possible. Um, I am really about transformational change system changes and ensuring that you know our systems are aligned when it comes to workforce systems and our resources right i'm looking forward to creating regional tables where we partner with king county and we partner with our other uh, other uh, uh number of other leaders in our community right um you know 15 being a seconds um okay since i have 15 seconds what i will say is our the commissioner voted against uh proposition one c tax 15 dollars minimum wage i would have been a strong advocate for that so our voting records would be different. Um, in 2021, she voted against the leasing of the Duwamish Valley Resource Center. And as port commissioner, I would have voted for that um, workforce center. And so I think there's numbers of uh, votes that she's taken that I would have taken differently, but really I'm running on a new vision. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Mary Kylie and then Alice. Hi, um, I was wondering if you could speak to um, plans or visions you have for making the port more accessible for people with disabilities as workers and also um, and mainly focusing on workers and then also people that are going through the port? Yeah, I, that's, that's a great question. Um, we are one of the only campaigns, I think probably in the nation, who um, uh, announced when we made our announcement, um, our campaign, we translated our materials into 12 different languages, including ASL. Um, and it has been very clear, this pandemic for me has underscored the need for us to make um, government operations more accessible, more accessible to our communities who are deaf and hard of hearing, um, and more accessible to folks who have are limited English speakers, especially um, at the Port of Seattle. Um, it, you know, Things like human trafficking, for instance, is we're a hot spot for human trafficking in our state because of all of the ports that are here and the fact that we have a, a, a we're bordered with with Canada. And I've been talking to 
Attorney General Bob Ferguson around this. If you look at the century agenda, it does not even say anything about language access. We don't have to wait a century to make the ports operations more accessible. And the same thing with like advising bodies um, for our disability community. When I look at folks who um, the port is, is using to advise them, it's not- That's too time, too sorry. That's time, I could go on. <laughs> Thank you, Alice, you're, you're next. Um, I uh, am wondering what you see is the port's role in um, creating and, and facilitating livable, walkable, bikeable communities that are safe for people who aren't in vehicles. I think often um, it's set up as this idea that there's like sort of the port and like the trucking industry against these like more, um, these like safer communities. And I'm just sort of wondering what your take is on that. Yeah, no, I think I think the port has a, a, a responsibility to ensure that we have, you know, more safe and walkable areas. Like if you look at port properties, right, whether it's the airport or whether it's our seaport, um, everyday people are walking through all of those spaces. Um, there's so many parks that fall under um, the port's uh, jurisdiction. And so it is so important that they play a strong role. And, uh, you know, I think the, the, the tricky thing about the port is there's various, um, permits and jurisdictions that they fall under. And so a lot of the times it takes partnering with a local city, it takes partnering with, um, you know, um, you know, any, any, any given local city. And so when I say we need strong leadership, that, that is what I'm talking about. We can advocate for things like housing, we can advocate for things like, you know, better roads um, that, you know, seconds. Yeah, better roads in partnership with um, our local cities and, you know, freight mobility. Um, if we have good roads, good bridges, it, it helps us be competitive. It makes um, uh, freight mobility you know, move. I will stop there because of the timer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's see. Are there any additional questions? Any additional questions? All right, I'm gonna go ahead and ask you to uh, go ahead and finish your uh, statement about the um, disability and, and access with the port. Okay, thank yeah. you. Um, you know, I wanna make our port um, the most accessible port in the region and um, and in our in our in the nation, and really, I want to do that in partnership with impacted community members, right? Folks who come from those communities, and really centering those voices. A lot of the times, we have government agencies have ideas for what community needs are, and they forget to really center those who are impacted and who who have those needs. And so um, that's what I intend to do, and make investments around that. Um, it's a top priority for me. Um, you know, I have a little niece who is deaf and we've all worked on learning how to uh, do sign language as, as a family. And, you know, I speak seconds. another language, I speak Somali. And so language access is also, you know, things that I care about. And I just have a different lens when it comes to these things. I see so much of my own family members through it. And um, I hope to bring that passion um, to the Port of Seattle. Great, thank you. Additional follow-up questions. Additional follow-up question. Right, I have another. Um, this one was actually asked by one of our uh, our environmental committee. They they um, submitted a question asking, "How would you use your office to address climate justice, ensuring a healthy environment and access to climate supporting solutions such as multimodal clean transportation options for all Washington residents?" Yeah, um, you know, I. I there's a lot of things that we need to do around making sure that you know we are centering um, the needs to to you know electrify our port um, and become a more sustainable um, you know government and uh, country. Like this is this is a is a, it's a crisis and there is a lot that the port can do. And I think in my previous question, um, I didn't talk about um, the seaport, but really um, port electrification is so important. Uh, solar panels and high capacity shore power and offshore floating uh, charging stations is gonna be so important. And that basically allows um, the ships to be able to, to plug into an electric grid um, while at dock, that will make a huge difference. And when I think about environmental justice, I think about in um, just transition ensuring that you know we are 
we are centering um, our labor workers, our union workers, and to ensure that you know communities who bear the brunt of climate change are also being called to the table to come up with the solutions. And so just transition will be so important to me. Um, it is uh, what I've been talking about, uh, creating green jobs and training workers for those jobs. And so um, that is something that I, I will prioritize. Great, thank you. And so with that, we're gonna go ahead and ask you for a one minute wrap up. Well, Thank you guys for the opportunity to, sh to share. Um, it's always uh, tough when you're sharing in two minutes or in one minute sort of frames, but I just wanna say again, now more than ever, we really do need strong leadership at all levels of government. Um, this, There is no going back to the way things were. And this is really a moment for us to reimagine and rebuild a new economy that will work for all of us. The port can lead our state in recovering from this devastating pandemic. Um, we need to establish shared regional plans to drive transformational change. Um, this is a moment for us to all work together, for us to align our work and to be able to build a workforce and systems that really um, center our communities and ensure that seconds. they will be able to build back better. Nobody's left behind. Thank you guys. <laughs> Great, thank you.